September 1972, the Munich Olympic Games. The Olympic Council of Ireland has always seen itself as representing the island rather than the state. It's been a contentious issue, especially in sports such as track and field and cycling. But in the boxing ring, there's never been any doubt. From the day the IABA was founded, amateur boxing in Ireland has been resolutely a 32-county sport. Ireland's six-man boxing team that travelled to Munich in 1972 was made up of three fighters from the south and three from the north. I see two more just arrived here, and let's move down a little bit here. And it's the two boys from uh, Derry. Charlie Nash, how are you, Charlie? How do you know? And Neil McLaughlin, how are things? Oh, going pretty well, you know. You always seem to me the coolest of all the boxers. Are you as cool as ever? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I don't know until I get in the ring, you know. <laughs> the Munich Olympics 1972 brought the whole issue of sports and politics onto a global stage. Eleven Israeli athletes and coaches were kidnapped and then killed by Palestinian gunmen as the sound of gunfire resounded around the Olympic village. For Ireland's boxers, especially those from the north, it was a grim reminder of home. I remember when the, when the shooting was going on, our lads were able to sit there and they were sitting in the middle of the square listening and they were able to say right away, you know, that's SLRs, that's not starting pistols that they knew. <laughs> and it was sad, very sad. The resumption of the Troubles in 1969 brought a sudden end to most sports in Belfast. But the amateur boxers fought on. Yes, indeed, a clear cut win for Hugh Russell from Belfast. Even through the worst of the violence, the IABA managed to maintain the sport as a 32 county entity. Dave Larmour of Northern Ireland. Boxers from the North represented Northern Ireland at the Commonwealth Games and then donned an Irish vest to box for Ireland in the internationals. At the National Stadium, the lightest weight always carried the flag. In those days, I was the, the flyweight, so I carried the flag. Even though it was a tricolour, it didn't matter to me. Could have, I've said before, it could have been the skull and crossbones. I wouldn't give it fiddlers, you know, my flag. As Belfast became scarred with checkpoints and barbed wire, the boxing clubs that had thrived in the city found themselves on the front line of the sectarian violence. It was a dangerous place, and there's no doubt about it. This, is, this area would have been known as the Mortar Mile. There was more murders committed in this area on the Andrum Road and, and around North Belfast than anywhere else in, in, the, in, the, in the province. This club never closed one night from 1969 right through. Every night we were open for the kids, and the kids travelled in here from the Lake of the Shangle Road, from the Tigers Bay, from Gilnaherk. Now, they were what you'd call loyalist areas for by the Republican areas of the New Lodge, West Belfast, and Leg and Neil, Ardoyne, they all boxed here. Oh, Lama has got it. Well, that's a goal for Northern Ireland. I came from a loyalist area, Shankle Road. I trained in the Holy Family Boxing Club for donkey's years. I was the Holy Family's flyweight, went away with them every year to Bournemouth, national tournaments. And I'd met loads of guys that probably were in the Republican movement and never had I got any animosity or any threat towards me. I had some of my hardest fights going back to where I lived than coming over to the New Lodge Road. You can you expect that, but I, I got maybe insulted going back, what are you going over there to train for? Everybody knew who I was at the time. It was my sport and it was what I wanted to do and if it meant me going to Afghanistan or somewhere, I don't want to Afghanistan for boxing, you know. The part that played throughout the Troubles in keeping a lot of kids out of the hands of, say, the, the paramilitaries at the time and keeping them focused on their own sport, it was something, it was an escape for people, escape for children. Uh, it kept them dedicated to a sport that kept going throughout the whole Troubles while perhaps the world or the society was falling apart outside. And boxing should hold its head up within this city for the role it has played. And, you know, it was a beacon, a beacon light there throughout the whole time of the trouble. That light somehow managed to pervade into the very heart of darkness as boxing engendered a common cause behind the barbed wire walls of the H-blocks. I was the only one invited up into the prisons in Long Case 
to train the paramilitaries on both sides. We had the IRA, we had the, with the provost, we had the uh, UVF and the UDA and the official IRA. And if they couldn't get me, it wasn't on. Because remember, at that stage they weren't recognising the governor or anybody else in the prisons. And uh, it was just after Bobby Sands had died. I was in one of the compounds and the, they'd be asking me how the boys would have been doing, how are they doing, how are the boys getting on. Well, what they meant by how the boys were getting on, that was how was the provost getting on. So I was telling them, look, I'm having problems because I can't get the right stuff, the, the, my right gear in to work with them, so I'm having problems with them. And they said to me, Jerry, listen, take our gear down, we'll lend them our gear. Say that was a Monday, as long as you have it back here, and as long as I have it back here for you coming in on, the, on Wednesday. You know, so I'd say both sides at one another and killing each other on the outside. But on the inside, they were laying on their gear to provincials, vice versa. It's marvellous. Amateur boxing in Dublin at this time saw the emergence of Drimna as a real force. Well, here we are at the boxing session of the St. John Bosco Boys Club in Sparrow Road, Drimna. The club's roots went back to the St. John Bosco Centre, set up to look after the youth of an area which had seen a massive housing programme in order to alleviate the overcrowding in Dublin's inner city. Boxing flourished in Drimna, and it didn't hurt that the club coach was one of the great names in Irish boxing, Frankie Kerr. He was a very mild-mannered, quiet man. He wasn't suave or boastful about his achievements. But yeah, I have found it amazing when we would be out occasionally in the city that so many people seemed to know him and be aware of who he was. That's it, yeah. Maybe that came about because of his coaching career and he had started coaching boxing on the television also in the early days of RTE. Nothing to it. Now that's how you skip. It's that's easy when you know how, isn't it, Frankie? Sure. When you learn, when you learn the right way. Sure, it's an easy way to do it. It was fantastic as a young lad to have that situation where your father seemed to be respected, although he didn't encourage me to go into the boxing too much, which was probably wise, very wise on his part. In that, you know, I think he saw that I hadn't got the attributes. <laughs> Maybe I was a bit of a coward from the beginning. <laughs> to, to, to make any progress of boxing. He was throwing a long... Drimna's fortunes were boosted when Ireland's most successful boxer of the era hung up his gloves. That's why I was slipping in there. Be careful, I might lay one on you. <laughs> I never really walked away from the sport, and a lot of boxers do, and, and some come back in, in time afterwards, but I, I was straight into it, and I, I was coaching at Drimna. It was a wonderful club. Uh, had a lot of help there with other coaches as well. But yes, I took over the senior coaching in the club and took over Phil Sutliff, who was a very, very good fighter. High hitting Phil Sutliff, the Drimna Club and Dublin. We always fought on the street, like you had to protect yourself, especially when you have, I had four brothers at that time. I had kind of had to protect them all, you know what I mean, against, we just say rivalry, it was a thing that everyone kind of, Best at football, best at cycling the bikes, best at uh, boxing. You know, you want to do the best. There's that big right hand from Sutcliffe again. Park comes back and runs into more trouble. Phil would have been a real role model and a real fella you would aspire to become in that regard. That Philip was a senior champion and senior champions were worshipped. Mick Dowling sending his protege into the ring for the third and final round. My God, he had some wonderful heart. He would train. If you asked him to stand on his head for an hour in the corner, he wouldn't say why. He would just go and do it. And uh, as a result, he had fantastic success. Yes, for the majority vote, Sutcliffe gets there. Mick Dowling had won two European bronze medals in the late 60s and early 70s after which Ireland had a pretty lean period in major tournaments. But under Darling's tutelage, Phil Sutliff was about to break that barren spell. It was a big thing for Irish boxing at that time because I don't think anyone had won anything since McDowling. If, uh, and him being my coach and then me coming on top at that time, it was kind of, uh, it, was, it was a double joy for, uh, for especially for the Drimna Boxing Club. Philip was really the, the role model and the, the bench 
he set the bench to, to what we all wanted and uh, obviously he was an Olympian and Mick Dowling before him in Dreamer Boxing Club was an Olympian as well but when I, when I hit the 16 stage in my life I said I'm going to be the next one out of this club to go to the next Olympic Games and I made a solemn promise to myself that I was going to be the next one. Major tournaments like the Olympic Games and the European Championships remain the preserve of the elite few. But from the formation of the IABA back in 1911, for the rank and file club fighters, the event, year in, year out, is the national championship. Every season, tournaments are staged around the country with seniors and juniors of all weights slugging it out to get to the finals in Dublin. When we went to Dublin, we were like the little girl being coming up from the west. We were looking up at Nelson's Pillar, you see, <laughs> that type of thing. And it was really, it was frightening, you see. And unless you stretched from above in Dublin, you get nothing. You had to be on the floor flat. And that was it. When you won something up in Dublin, you were the man. <laughs> and everybody around our area, around Limerick, of course, would be oh, cheering you on and wishing you the best of luck. And, you know, Sunday morning, you might be doing an old session of trend. You get the older guys to come down and they're watching you and excites the situation. You know, and you think you're the be all and end all. But, you know, it was fantastic. One of the extraordinary feats in Irish boxing was the achievement of the three Crystal brothers, Terry, Mel and Joe, who all won senior Irish championships at the National Stadium on the same night, while all three were students at Trinity College. And I would imagine that's the end of it. Yes, the referee is standing in the second round. Irish heavyweight, Mel Crystal, scoring in round two, referee stopping the contest. It was special because you had people who are now, you know, orthopaedic consultants, veterinary surgeons, people who have doctorates in English, in French, who were all training with you. And while they were there, they, they were not thinking as academics, they were thinking as athletes. And they gave 100% and loved it. The university had a great tradition in the sport, and when the Crystal Brothers were boxing there, it helped that the club coach was an Olympic silver medalist. Fred, who won his silver medal in 1956, 20 years later, in 1976, he would skip non-stop for one hour. That was a level of fitness which we never experienced and fortunately Fred saw in us the uh, willingness to literally sup at his fountain of knowledge and use it uh, in our careers as, as boxers. And he says box on. The Crystal Brothers won their championships during the build-up to the Olympic Games in Moscow in 1980. They could have formed the nucleus of that team. Well, there's a prospect for you for international boxing. At middleweight, Terry Crystal. But this was a time when amateur boxing in Ireland was struggling on the international stage. And the Crystals had very different ideas to the hierarchy of the IABA as to the reasons why. The Irish international amateur boxing team was training in a place called the Ordnery Hotel in uh, Drogheda. And the, the sparring was for the internationals were, was between themselves, literally. There, there was no funneling 
of, of different sparring partners. At that time, we were told, be in the Ordinary Hotel on the blank day of blank, otherwise you will not be considered for Moscow. And that was so ridiculous, we decided uh, no. Jerry Story coached the Irish team that competed at the Munich, Montreal and Moscow Olympics. Munich and Montreal were very much tales of near misses. But the team selected for Moscow in 1980 travelled with real optimism. In its ranks was a 19-year-old from Clonus, who two years previously had become the youngest fighter ever to win a Commonwealth gold. Oh, oh McGuigan has got it. And I don't think you can believe it. It was an instant love affair, myself and boxing, because I got my dad to bring me to the nearest boxing club, which was nine miles away, in a place called, um, it was, the club was called Wattle Bridge, uh, ABC. We went out about five, six times, and nobody turned out. And we, I was just about to give up, and we saw a guy walking along the road with a rucksack on his back. And um, he had his, he had like a black eye. And I thought, well, we've got a chance here. This this is bound to be a boxer. And he was a guy called Little, and I can't remember what his first name was. But I went into the Wattlebridge Club and saw the all again the smell of the gym. I just got immediately attracted to. It. I said, this is definitely for me. This is Barry McGuigan boxing at these Olympics and boxing like a real star. And there's a beautiful right hand, and the referee steps in to give him a count. I enjoyed woodwork at school, and we used to take our, our little pieces of, of work home with us. I remember writing down the little wooden top that I'd made. I remember writing on the bottom of it, you know, Olympic gold medal, Moscow 1980. That's what I want to do. McGuigan lost a disputed decision to Wilfred Kabunda in the second round, and it pretty much signalled the end of his days in the amateur ranks. Before the year was out, McGuigan had signed on as a professional with Barney Eastwood, and the rest is history. Zaragoza it is. The Mexican has put the young Irishman, 20-year-old Phil Sutcliffe... With McGuigan and the rest of the Irish team bowing out in the early rounds, Ireland's hopes of a first Olympic medal since Jim McCord in 1964 rested with Belfast flyweight Huey Russell. Hugh Russell will tell the story that in 1980, when he fought in Moscow, rioting stopped on the streets of the New Lodge for 20 minutes when his fights were on. And the wounds were caught there by a good combination from the young Irishman. I think everybody at goes thinks he can get a medal, otherwise you wouldn't uh, be picked. Three more minutes to go, and if he wins this one, he's in the medal stage. You need to be a bit of luck too. Not, maybe luck's not the right word, because I say to people, uh, I was lucky and people say, well, you were lucky more than once. So, I mean, fortunate. Uh, you need to get the right draw. You need to have the right people around you that can control you and look after you. For you, Russo, Irlandia. He was a bit lucky, but he wins Delicious. nevertheless. Delicious. Good win for Hugh Russell, so he's in the medal stage. I was very fortunate that I brought my club coach, Jerry Story was my club coach, who was also the national coach. So we small things like that mean a lot to the fighter. So he was able to come with me and be with me the whole time of the Olympics. Second round. Russell finding this man a bit awkward. The 70s was a difficult decade for Irish boxing. The regular flow of medals at Olympic Games and European Championships dried up as the powerful nations of amateur boxing became ever more professional and scientific in their approach. And he's caught and back he goes into the ropes. The gulf between what was happening in Ireland and the Eastern Bloc countries in particular was getting wider. Yes, a unanimous win there for Peter Lessev. So out of the championship goes Hugh Russell. Keir think at that stage was working at the docks. He was working on, I think it was a shipping company. But uh, I think that was one item that Q lost his job over the head of, of training and boxing because this is the, 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 the problems our lad had was, was trying to get off work. Like, I had to hold down two jobs, train, right, and, 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 and help my mother get along because we, we, I was the eldest of, of ten kids. Anything we had to do within Ireland on an international base was done purely voluntary. And I think we did very well for that. Um, but when you, when you come up 
uh, against the Russians or you come up against the Cubans. You know, you just, you just, it's virtually impossible. It was virtually impossible to beat these guys because they were professional amateurs. They were being trained um, professionally. They were, they were training every day and being paid um, to do that. Despite this chronic lack of cash, Ireland's merry band of students, soldiers, bricklayers and pot washers would routinely don the green of the IABA and set up for far-flung rings to take on the best of the Europeans or the Americans. We boxed in Yankee Stadium in New York first, and then we went on to, uh, to fight in Boston. Well, I tell you, it was a dream come true for me because I didn't know what it was like to go to Belly Bunyan, to mind go to America. <laughs> when you met up with the team that morning, the, the manager would, would give you a track, so go in there to the toilet and put it on you and uh, come back out with it on. And when he counted all the tracksuits, then he was at to give a note. <laughs> and then when you get off the plane, he counted them again to take them back off you again. <laughs> you'd go in and you'd look at the opposition, you'd, you'd be looking around to see which guy in my fight, and you'd be trying to pick out a guy that's roughly the same size as you. But you see the muscles bulging out of him, and you're thinking, geez, he couldn't be the same weight as me. Do you know, but he, he was, and that's because he, they had a the high performance uh, coach and stuff, and, doing the conditional work and everything with them, you know, the dietitians and everything, so they were spot on. Whereas we were just, we were eating whatever your man put up on the table and that's the way it was, you know. We were living in the Stone Age and actually remember we went to a beautiful place in, in Kerry to train for, to acclimatise and everything to get ready for the Korea Olympics, you know. It was, when I think back on it, it was funny, prepare on our own and the, the way we've advanced and changed now. Yeah, we were, we were a third world country in, in, in that respect. Our top athletes were, in America, training and preparing with the best in the world, and uh, but the rest of us as boxers, and we always had some very good, talented lads, but we weren't getting the proper preparation. By the time the Olympics were staged in Seoul in 1988, things had begun to change. The Cuban coach Trotman Daly was brought in, and the Irish team had in its ranks two up-and-coming fighters, Wayne McCullough and Michael Carruth. Trotman wasn't really liked by the guys, you know what I mean? They brought us into training camp into, down to Kerry and um, we stayed in a hotel down Stagford down in Kerry and we were, we were pulled into this six, eight week cycle of getting ready for these European Championships. And what he done to us was unbelievable, like he just killed us, you know what I mean? But it brought us to a level that we felt, you know, we're gonna be able to compete with these guys. The Olympics is always the pinnacle, it's always the thing. Every amateur boxer wants to get there. And if they, if they say they don't, well, they're lying. I think it was about two weeks before my 21st birthday that I got the, the, the phone call and, boy, God, did we, did we jump all over the place. And there's nothing better because, you know, at that time you were picked by your peers to go and represent your country. I was twice senior champion. I'd won a couple of multi-nations and, um, you know, I got picked to go. Before setting off for Seoul, the Olympic Committee of Ireland made the controversial move of asking Wayne McCullough, a Protestant from the Shankill Road area of Belfast, to carry the tricolour at the opening ceremony. The Belfast Telegraph phoned and asked the Irish chef to miss him. I heard Wayne McCullough carrying the tricolour. Cool, cool. Do you know that he's from... And Pat Hickey, who was the chef to mission at the time, now the president, I said, oh, no, no, I didn't know that. I mean, of course he knew, but nobody asked him, listen, do you live on the Shanker Road or do you live on the Falls Road or where do you live? Because the people in Dublin and the rest of them couldn't give a damn. Michael Carruth for Ireland, tramp for Sweden. And Carruth's gone in the open round right at the bell. Ireland's boxers returned from Seoul without a medal, and the IABA immediately set up a program to improve its coaching setup. It was ambitious stuff, but it received little or no financial support at the time. IABA president Brendan O'Connor and his team travelled the country and gave seminars to clubs and coaches all over Ireland. Irish boxers were always known as being courageous, as brave fighters. Now we want to uh, tie on to that, that they would also become uh, scientific, uh, skillful, technical boxers as well. In other words, they would, we would add on the skills of tactics, of technique, of, of uh, professional co conditioning, of mental fitness, onto the, the, the fantastic foundation of, uh, of the courage and the fighting spirit uh, that came naturally to them anyway.
The first signs that the new system was working came in the European Championships of 1991, when Paul Griffin became the first Irishman to win gold since Maxi McCulloch's win back in Oslo in the 40s. I was boxing out my skin. I knew it was going to be that Russian in the final. But uh, yeah, it was a fantastic feeling. It didn't sit in for a while, really. You know, I was a bit young to kind of you know, realise how, how big of an achievement it was because if you can remember back that time, it was, it was 42 years since someone had won a gold medal, you know, it's, and then me to come along and beat a Russian in the final, it, 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 was, it was crazy, you know. Griffin's gold in Gothenburg was all the more remarkable because the seismic changes in Europe's political makeup had swung the balance of power in boxing sharply eastwards. When USSR broke up, we now have 15 different separate entities where it used to be just one team. Now there's Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Ukraine, White Russia, now Belarus, and, and on and on it goes. And so, and Ireland, to compete in that sort of company, had to have, get their house in order. And how they did it was fantastic. By the time Barcelona came along, things were different. There was a Cuban trainer. You had the McCulloughs, uh, the Karuts, being sent to east to the Eastern European countries, to uh, all over Europe for tournaments and for training camps. That was the way to win medals. The team that left for the Barcelona Olympics was the best prepared unit to have traveled to a major games up to that point. Michael Carruth and Wayne McCullough were back in the team for a second crack at an Olympic medal. And with European champion Paul Griffin in the ranks, the boxers departed with a real mood of optimism. Paul Griffin having a hard time in this contest, training by three points, and he's gone. Things just didn't go my way in 92, to be honest, you know. I had a bit of a bad, I had a bad uh, experience at the Olympic Games. They, they stopped the fight. They shouldn't have stopped the fight. Paul Griffin is disgusted. The, top. the more I look at the, the DVD now, I even say I can't believe that they stopped that fight. You know, it was ridiculous. After a bad start, Ireland's boxers started winning, and by the time the tournament reached the semi-final stage there were still two Irishmen standing, both guaranteed a bronze medal at the very least. Six, six points. Wayne and myself were building up such a great relationship with one another. He'd win, I'd win, he'd win, I'd win. We actually got to meet this guy, uh, one of the, the yachts guys, and I can't think of his name, and he was talking to this Australian. Now, we were behind the barriers because we couldn't get in. They'd finished all their, their, their regattas and what have you. And he actually showed us this, um, he won a silver medal, and I'd never seen a medal, an Olympic medal before. So I said, can I have a look at it? I said, because I know I'm going to get it, go, you know, but, you know, can I have a look at it? He said, what have you got so far? I said, what have you got? I said, well, we're bronze medalists. I said, we won the bronze today. And um, 
he showed me the medal. Ah, oh, mine's better than yours. And he was a bit. He had a few too many champagnes, I'd say. But um, I said, we're not finished yet. I said, we, we can still go on. I said to him, you know what I mean. And I didn't like his attitude, you know. And he was going. Ah. I said, listen. When I had hair, it was kind of gold. You know? And I said, there's only one colour goes with my hair. And I said, and that's gold. And so came Saturday, August 8th, 1992, the day of the boxing finals in Barcelona. And for the first time ever, Ireland had two fighters going for gold. A little man from Belfast knows exactly what he's got to do. Well, the Cuban looking very assured and very composed, and he's hurt McCulloch with that left. There was blood in the eye of uh, McCulloch, and I couldn't see where a cut was. And that really shows just how hard this man has been hitting. But it turned out there was no cut. There was something burst underneath his eye there. A muscle, a bone, something, and the blood was squirting out of his eye. Kind of surreal, really. Because of my under pressure for the first time, but time ticking away from McCulloch. What a great third round he's produced, my goodness. Wayne pushed him right to the limit. Wayne was still throwing punches at the, the final bell. And what that showed me with Wayne was that these guys are not bulletproof. These guys are me and you. They're ten fingers, you know, two legs. Everything that goes with blood goes through their veins. So, you know. Wayne McCulloch. Well, he's got that. 14-8. The Irish celebrate another silver from Belfast, Wayne McCulloch. Two weights later. Up comes Michael Cruz to box Juan Hernandez of Cuba. Presenting Michael Cruz. Getting to an Olympic final was, was, was a huge thing. The build up back here was, was part of the, the excitement with it as well. You know, I knew I was up against it. I knew like Juan Hernandez Sierra, you know, like the guy had won everything. He'd won Pan Americans, he'd won world titles, he'd, you name it, this guy had won everything. So a difficult task for Michael Carruth, the 25-year-old from the Drimna Amateur Boxing Club in Dublin, the most experienced man internationally in the Irish team. I was as nervous as hell, you know, like absolutely terrified. That Saturday morning, I, I can remember it well because I was I was managing St Pat's and we were due to play in that loan in um, a Leinster Cup game, and it would, must have been the only day as a football manager when it wasn't the most important day in my life. And Carruth is leading by four points to three. In Cruz's corner was his late father Austin and Nicholas Cruz Hernandez, who was a Cuban and a Cuban former Cuban coach. Now, Michael's natural instinct would be to go forward and fight. But the boy said, no, no, you have to restrain yourself. That's what the clever Hernandez would want you to do. And they kept him back. They kept him on a leash. And it was a perfect, uh, technically and tactically perfect. Well, the Irish really getting behind their man. What great support they've given Wayne McCulloch and now Michael Carruth. The score was eight apiece going into the last round. And as the final bell neared, the fight was still very close. Freddie Tate lost in the final in 56th round at welterweight and lost on a split decision. Michael Carruth had a warning in the second. And that, one wonders, will it be the decisive factor in this contest? Eight points each going into the third and final round. And Carruth may just have done enough. If someone gave me 100 quid or 1,000 quid to put on a box to win the gold medal, I'd have put it on him you know, to win the Olympic gold, you know what I mean? Because that's how fancied and strong I thought he was. This really would be a great moment. Hernandez shakes his head. The Irish wave their flags. We went into the middle of the ring, and there's always a thing in boxing that when, a, when you've won, the referee tends to have a good grip of you, you know? And he's barely holding me. But I hear, here, hold it bloody hand, you, and... Uh, Please let me win this, please let me, you know. Lo and behold, they were waffling off in Spanish and the uh, Campione Olympics. And I got to there, I think, you know what I mean? And I just broke away. I just went all the way around the ring and, and got for those ropes. And then go back to the corner and give my father a hug. And look, uh, 17 and a half, 18 years of us two trying for this and to actually do it. 
the first gold medal of all time for Ireland in Olympic boxing. It was an ambition of mine to see an Irishman win an Olympic gold medal. It could be in anything. From Tiddlywinks, I know that's not an Olympic sport, but I didn't care. Michael Carruth won a, a gold medal at the Olympic Games under the dream of Baller. Was a, was a, it was a good feeling for, for me and for the family to think that, you know, this was something that your father was involved in as a seed. Being able to walk around to the house after the fight and see the madness on the street, the madness in the garden, the total joy that it was about the achievement, you know, it was, it was a great day, it, was, it really was. I know when I stood on that, that podium, I was somewhere else. I was just, this is me, someone's in my body, and, you know, and they're impersonating me, hopping on, I'm an Olympic champion, you know, and I'm standing on this podium, and I'm shocked. The Barcelona Olympics was a huge endorsement of the IABA's new regime. Coaching structures were put in place all over the country, and the results were there for all to see. Irish boxers were now able to compete in the highly professional world of amateur boxing. Yet the sport still depended on the goodwill of volunteers, and the success at international level disguised what was still a chronically underfunded organisation. We got a promise from the Irish government then that they would look at financing amateur boxing and they began to pay boxers rather than throw a lot of money at it and spread it between 40 boxers it was initially decided to give to the best boxer to spend the money on the guys that had the best chance of winning. Nowhere was the Cinderella nature of amateur boxing in Ireland more apparent than in the West. Francis Barrett of Galway was the flag bearer for the Irish Olympic team in Atlanta four years later but he didn't even have a gym in which to train. Box was always strong in Galway, but uh, uh, for premises, it wasn't great at the time. Uh, we trained uh, on the guidance of Chick Gillen. No, honey, use your right hand Francis Barrett trained uh, at, in the back of a container, 40 foot container for the Olympics in 1996. And that's where, that's where we come from. The IABA finally managed to get a decent slice of Celtic Tiger prosperity with the establishment of the Irish Sports Council in 1999. As Ireland's best performing Olympic sport, boxing was in a good position to capitalize as the medals came in. The centerpiece of this new investment was the establishment of a high performance unit next door to the National Stadium in Dublin where the elite of the country's boxers could be groomed for top flight competitions. The Sports Council came in with real money. So we were able to establish uh, a specific uh, elite unit composed of not only uh, uh, top class coaches uh, and elite boxers, but also the, sci the sports science backup for these. Uh, physiotherapists, uh, sports psychologists, so all the sports science backup that was necessary for uh, a really professional approach. We have a motto on the wall, you only achieve what you believe. We give them that belief, you know, we've taken away all the excuses that we had, that I had in my day with that, you know, they have a support service and a support team wrapped around them that caters for all their needs. So all they got to focus on is performance. Um. The opportunity that they have there now, like they just tore up for training, they go to rest, they sleep, they're like good greyhounds or good horses. Like it's like a stallion of a stallion of a good stable. You're up in Dublin like for four days every week, a solid training like and the competition up there, like we have the standard of Irish box and like we're like the second team in Europe. And like the, there's always someone pushing like, or clipping at your heels trying to take your place. So the competition we have up there is unreal. We have three or four lads in each weight division competing for that one place. 
which is, you know, the sparring and the training sessions over there are phenomenal. And we've told these guys that if you guys show us that you were the best here in the gym, we, we'll have a look at you and we'll give you your opportunity. And so everybody's pushing each other to get better, you know. And so we're being tested physically, technically, tactically and mentally before we leave Ireland. So then whatever hits us in Europe, then we're, we're ready for it. Not only are Ireland's elite boxers among the best trained sports people in the country, they're also among the best paid. The more successful a boxer becomes, the more money they get. But lose a few fights, and that money goes away. The card system where boxers go out and win tournaments, and if you win a tournament, you get so much money, and they can build up um, a pool of money that can be paid very handsomely now. And that's where, that's where the basis of our success is at. The, the guys are properly being paid and rightfully being paid. And the coaches and the coaching staff are all being paid. And, and that's a good professional amateur situation to be in. By the time of the Beijing Olympics in 2008, Ireland could send out a team of full-time boxers to a games for the first time. The five-man team that went to China had benefited from the very best training and preparation. And now the pressure was on the IABA needed medals to show a return on the investment. Okay, I always had the dream of going to the Olympic Games. I wanted to have the tracksuit with the five rings on it. That's what I wanted. You know, you watch it on TV every four years, and all these guys performing to their best in their chosen sport. At the time, I didn't feel it was good enough, but it says, with the right training and the right people around me, all I wanted to do was be an Olympian. I remember Kenny coming down to my house the year before the Olympics and I was having a little talk with him. And I think at this stage he was seven or eight times Irish champion. And I said, it doesn't give a rat's arse, Kenny, eight senior championships. You need to get to an Olympic Games. 2004, I had three failed attempts. I had two failed attempts for Beijing, so the last chance to lose one. Talking about doing it the hard way. <laughs> That's me all over. So we went to the qualifier in Athens. Mentally, I felt good. I said, this, this, this is my time to shine here now. I boxed a guy from Holland in my first fight. Then I boxed an Italian, be him. So then it was the German to qualify. And I remember doing everything right, just thinking about the, the warm up, get into the ring, touch gloves, box. We're level after the first. Come back to the corner. Right, that's not bad. You're not winning, you're not losing. And we're down to the second round. And we get into a bit of a clinch. And I just took a step back. And just a thousand thoughts come through my mind. Are you going to be remembered as an eight-time senior champion? Or do you want to be remembered as an Olympian? You need to win this fight here. And that's where I won my, uh, my Olympic medal, you know. I, I won it in Athens. I just went to Beijing to collect it. We have a Russian referee in charge. So believe me, there'll be no nonsense. And away they go. The biggest, biggest moment in Kennedy Egan's young career. It was a great experience, the Olympic Games for me, and everything that could have went right did. But it wasn't because, of, it wasn't the luck factor, it was because I wanted it to go right, because I trained so hard all my life. And I, I actually made my own luck. Five, four, count down. It was a proud moment for myself and, and the country, you know. It's a gold medal for China. And Kennedy, and naturally he's disappointed. And a silver for Ireland. And what a great Olympic Games for Kennedy. And Beijing was mighty. Darren Sutherland. I thought Darren should have won it, really. Could have won it, really. And the fellow to whom he lost, uh, De Gael, is now one of the top-notch British professional fighters. Paddy Barnes. Paddy was electrifying. I went to have in Beijing, just, just couldn't destroy it, but it was just an amazing feeling because there was so much in the public interest, you no, know, in the sporting end of things. Like you're in the papers every day, on TV every day, and everybody was watching you and supporting you, and it's just unreal as it was. Super medalist representing Ireland. Von Kennett smile. This is your life. It is a small country we live in, four and a half million people. Uh, and to go out there and, and mix it with the best in the world and come home with a medal. And to think the five boxers that did travel, three medals out of five, but we all got beaten by the eventual winners. 
If there was a certain reluctance within the IABA initially to the idea of paying coaches and boxers in what was supposed to be an amateur sport, there was another seismic change afoot that would shake the organization to its core. As the IABA drew towards the end of its first century, it had to face up to an issue that wouldn't even have crossed the minds of its founding fathers. Girls. I think a lot of clubs did not have women involved uh, at any level, like a, a mother being there or a, a female secretary, uh, and just the fact of bringing in one or two young girls in this very male-dominated uh, area didn't feel really safe, and there was not a tradition of how to deal with the girls. And then I think there was a kind of fear as well. Um, how do we treat girls that might get hurt? How much will they cry? Can the girls actually take this hard sport? The old stadium on the South Circular Road in Dublin has witnessed all the greats of Irish boxing, from Jimmy Ingle back in the 30s to crack high performance teams of modern times. But if there's one fight that changed the course of Irish amateur boxing history, it was on an October night in 2001 when a 15-year-old from Bray stepped between the ropes for the first woman's bout to be staged in Ireland. I was very nervous back and I can remember and uh, there's, I think I brought a big crowd in with me as well and my whole family were there and all my friends and it was just a huge night for, for women's boxing really um, in the country. It was the first official fight. I didn't understand the makeup of a woman to be argued about. I would think, what happens if you get, you get blows on your chest? But of course there's protection, and of course there's everything else. That's silly of me and uneducated of me to worry about that. And also women didn't box in general, and they, more, they swung more than they punched. See Katie Taylor? She is unbelievable. I mean, she really is something else. I was boxing for years and years without actually kind of getting a fight really. I was just kind of training with all the guys and um, I didn't really think anything of it to be honest. I was involved in so many other sports at that time as well so this was kind of something to help me, help me um, in those sports as well and um, I just thought it was, I found it so enjoyable and I loved, uh, loved it from the start really. Just see her on the on the pads. She take your shoulder off. Oh, strictly boxing skills. Jab, jabs, cross, cross, jab. Body punches, head. She's special. I don't think many of the fellows would fancy taking her on. To be honest. It's definitely uh, been a great few years for me and what I've done in the sport, it's, it's brought me to a lot of uh, as well as new experiences as well. Yes. To film a big Lucas Aid advert and such a big production with Tiny Temp and Travis Barker, it's people who ne I never thought I I'd meet in a lifetime, so I'm just blessed to be uh, as well as a part of the sport and the, the life that's given me. The IABA celebrated its centenary in 2011, and the elite boxers of the high performance unit, boasting an array of European, world, and Olympic medalists, arrived for the national championships with the added incentive that a place at the London Olympics was on the line. The big story was expected to be Kenny Egan, winning an Irish title for the 11th time. But the 2011 championships will always be remembered for the emergence of a new star. I went in there as the underdog, but um, I really was relaxing in there because I know who I was facing. Like, I, mean, I knew like, that he was a really, really top athlete who I was going against. Like, and all I have to do now is go in and perform. If the right result came on, I win the fight like, and I'd probably be recognised for beating him for years. Like. I can't forget the dignity of Kenny Egan losing to Joe Ward in that great fight and how he handled it and how, how just 
d dignified and decent he was at the end of it. I, I thought he was, he was quite, he got a harsh deal in the fight. I felt the warnings were harsh. To me, he was al already, my feelings about him, my thoughts about him were of huge respect, but he went up in my estimation 10 times as a result of the defeat, as much of his great victories. I only realize now what the fight like meant to me, like to me. If we didn't have to win the fight, we probably wouldn't have been able to win the Europeans. I mean, Europeans probably wouldn't have been able to go to the qualifiers. And years to come, when you're doing an interview with somebody, and I'm long gone, there'll be somebody saying, and you mark my words, there's a fella called Joe Ward, and he was one of the greatest ever. So the IABA embarks on the second century as one of the major nations in the sport. The days of the brave Irish boxer stepping into the ring as an underdog, fighting for an upset against an American, Cuban, or Russian, are over. Oh, what a good left hand he's got with a good weapon on the floor. The sport is much the same as it was a century ago, with scores of volunteers come rain or shine, opening up village halls and inner city gyms around the country. The difference now is that amateur boxing in Ireland is basking in a golden glow. There are people of my age group will tell you, oh, there were great days. There'll never be another era like Jerry Coleman and Perry and Teeth and all those. But listen, I want to tell you the facts. This is the golden age. Not alone have we got the seniors. Not alone have we got, we've got juniors. We've got youths winning the world championships. Oh, my God! You say sometimes champions are born. I believe that, that they are, but most of them are made. You have to want it, you have to, you know, you have to breed it, you have to eat it, you have to, everything that goes with that to become a champion. The structures that they've set up for producing champions here is a, a model that many other sports could follow. But I don't think anyone will be able to match the achievements of the high performance boxing unit in, in, uh, in Ireland. I firmly believe that um, it, the sluice gates, as far as talent is concerned, have yet to be fully opened in Ireland. Because you have young boxers in the four corners of this country who have yet to be discovered. And if they are tapped into the system that has been put in place by the amateur authorities to date and by the Olympic Council of Ireland, um, I have no doubt that uh, for a long time to come, we will uh, have success.